Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In this video, I am going to be listing 10 Jehovah's Witness teachings that aren't Bible-based. Now, there are a few things I want to say before I get into my list. If you want to skip straight to my list, you'll find in the description below there are timestamps for each of the things I'm going to be talking about. So if you don't have much time, feel free to look in the description and warp straight to whatever topic specifically interests you. However, I do want to explain why this video is relevant. Why should it matter whether Jehovah's Witness teachings are Bible-based or not? Well, hopefully it's self-evident <laughs> that a religion that purports to represent the God of the Bible should be basing its teachings on the Bible. But I did want to share a couple of other thoughts with you. Specifically, I'll begin with Revelation 22 verse 18 where it says, I am bearing witness to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone makes an addition to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this scroll. And if anyone takes anything away from the words of the scroll of this prophecy, God will take his portion away from the trees of life and out of the holy city things that are written about in this scroll. Now, you could read this verse and say, okay, I see where you're going with this, Lloyd. You're talking about this curse that's mentioned in Revelation that effectively says, if you're going to add to these words, if you're going to include your own teachings, then you're cursed. Well, doesn't that just apply to Revelation? You could say that. I've always understood those words to also apply to the Bible as a whole. But even if we're just going to limit the application of those words to Revelation and to the themes discussed in Revelation, well, at least three of the items that I'm going to be discussing today, namely item three, item four, and item seven, are all falling really under what's being described here because they all either have to do with prophecy or what happens to good people after they die, which is what Revelation is describing. So that's something that I think is quite serious to consider if you're approaching this from the perspective of a Jehovah's Witness who takes the Bible to be the inerrant word of God and a book that should be heeded, where you shouldn't just be making up teachings that aren't Bible-based. Another thing I just want to point out about the Bible, here is my copy of the New World Translation. Obviously, it's a, a thick book, <laughs> If you know nothing else about the Bible, you know that it's a big book and there's lots in it. In fact, I counted the page numbers in the New World Translation. The last page of Revelation 22 is page 1661. Genesis 1 begins in the New World Translation on page 43, which gives us 1,618 pages of Bible. And I'm stressing that number because I don't think that if you're God, if you are the creator of all things and you're interested in passing on your wisdom, passing on your guidance to mankind... I don't see how you would need more pages than that. Or to put it more bluntly, I don't see how it can be necessary to add teachings as if to say, oh, these are the teachings that God didn't get round to mentioning. I think 1,618 pages is plenty. And I think 
if a teaching isn't mentioned in those 1,618 pages, it's not worth talking about in the context of a religion that claims to be Bible-based. Hopefully I've made that point clear. Why add teachings to the Bible? Why put words in God's mouth effectively when God's provided this book with ample room in it to cover everything, to cover all of the do's and don'ts? I also wanted to talk a little bit about the condemnation of fundamentalist Judaism in Watchtower literature, specifically this criticism of the notion of offence around the law, which is how I always understood the extreme kind of pharisaical adding to the rules of the Mosaic law. It's actually described in a 1996 Watchtower article, which I will read because, again, this is relevant to our discussion this is Watchtower or the Jehovah's Witness leadership, in my view, criticizing the Jewish people or Jewish religious leaders for doing something that they were already doing at the time that they wrote this. So the Watchtower article of 1996, September 1st, page 11 say some of the worst damage to the law was done by the very ones who claimed to be teaching and preserving it. This happened after the days of the faithful scribe Ezra of the 5th century BCE. Ezra fought hard against the corrupting influences of other nations and stressed the reading and teaching of the law. Some teachers of the law claimed to follow in Ezra's footsteps and formed what came to be termed the Great Synagogue. Among its sayings was the directive, make a fence around the law. These teachers reasoned that the law was like a precious garden, in order that no one should trespass in this garden by transgressing its laws, they created further laws, the oral law, to prevent the people from coming close to such error. And then further on down it says, At first these laws were not to be written, lest they be taken as equal to the written law, but gradually human thinking was put ahead of the divine, so that eventually this fence actually damaged the very garden it was supposed to protect. Isn't that interesting? I always had that in, in the back of my mind from when I first heard about this fence around the law and it always troubled me. Well, isn't that exactly what we're doing? We being Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously I'm not one now, but don't Jehovah's Witnesses do that when they add all of these different rules that are nowhere to be found in the Bible? Are they not guilty of creating this fence around the law or fence around what's said in the Bible that's supposed to stop people from coming anywhere close to doing anything that might even approach being going against the Bible? Isn't that exactly what the organization is about. And specifically on the subject of the Pharisees, it's also worth noting what was said in the 2012 Watchtower, May 15th on page 30. The Pharisees' rules and traditions made the application of the law burdensome for the common people. The Mosaic law furnished the overall structure for Israel's worship of Jehovah. However, Minute details were not provided. For instance, the law forbade work on the Sabbath, but it did not explicitly define what constituted work and what did not. The Pharisees sought to fill in such supposed gaps by means of their laws, definitions and traditions. While Jesus ignored the arbitrary rules of the Pharisees, he did observe the Mosaic law. 
he saw beyond the letter of the law. Jesus discerned the spirit behind the law and the need for mercy and compassion. He was reasonable, even when his followers failed him. And further on down, under questions for meditation, it says, Do I seek to lay down arbitrary, inflexible rules or to turn my personal opinions into law? Am I reasonable in what I expect of others? Reflect on the contrast between Jesus' teaching and that of the Pharisees. Do you see ways in which you could improve? If so, why not resolve to do so? So the organisation has the goal to lecture Jehovah's Witnesses on not being too pharisaical, on not being overly demanding, by burdening people with rules and traditions that aren't necessary. And yet, as with what I was saying earlier about the fence around the law, there are a number of items in my list which constitute teachings that place a burden on people in some way, and yet they are nowhere found in the Bible. And for reference, those items are items 1, 5, 8, 9, and 10. So I wanted to give a little bit of context as to why this video is relevant. And with all of that out of the way, let's get stuck in to item number one, which is shunning. Now, as it happens, I've already done a video, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear here. <laughs> it's titled 14 Bible Verses That Debunk Jehovah's Witness Shunning. That's right, 14 Bible verses. And rather than list all of those verses, if you're in any way in doubt as to whether shunning is or isn't biblical, please check out that video. I think I make quite a strong, robust argument against shunning as being biblical. Obviously, you can find verses that can be twisted and contorted to support Watchtower's position on shunning, but what you can't find is a verse anywhere in the Bible that makes it okay to mandate shunning even, even, in a family setting. That's where the Jehovah's Witness teaching on shunning becomes unbiblical. And to give you just a couple of examples from those 14, and again, if you're in any doubt on this subject, please check out that video. There's a verse in Matthew 9, verses 10 to 13. Later, as he, that's Jesus, was dining in the house, look, many tax collectors and sinners came and began dining with Jesus and his disciples. But on seeing this, the Pharisees said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Hearing them, he said, healthy people do not need a physician, but those who are ill do. Go then and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call not righteous people, but sinners. So it's worth noting, because you could say, oh, well, Jesus is the one person or was the one person on the planet who had permission to be not shunning sinners. He was okay doing that because he was Jesus. He was the physician and he was making these sinners well by eating with them. <laughs> you could make that argument if you want, but what do we see here? It says he was dining with his disciples. His followers were dining with him and with the sinners. If you're going to say, oh, well, Jesus needed to be doing that, well, why Jesus and all of his disciples dining with the sinners? This doesn't, for me, 
paint a picture of a Jesus who was okay with shunning. And what you actually find, again, applying this to the family setting, when you dig down into what Jesus taught about the family and relationships, is you find a Jesus who would almost certainly have been appalled at the way disfellowshipping extends into the family arrangement. And another verse I cite in my video where I give 14 examples is that of the story of the, or the parable of the prodigal son. Because as I've mentioned many times on this channel, what's interesting about the prodigal son story is that first of all, the son only returns when he runs out of money. That's not really true repentance, is it? If you're only going to stop sinning because you've literally lost your means to sin, that would be called, I think the phrase is worldly sadness, if this were being considered. If the prodigal son were in a judicial committee before the elders, they would consider his returning only after he ran out of money to constitute worldly sadness and therefore he would be disfellowshipped as being unrepentant. That's the first thing. The second thing is, when does the father race to meet the son? Is it after the son has filled out a questionnaire to say whether he's repentant or not? Or is it when the father sees the son when he is still a long way off. A long way off, no means of sitting down and interrogating him as to whether he's sorry or not or how repentant he is. The father just races to meet his son and embraces him and considers him someone who has been reclaimed almost from the grave. So I can't think of a more powerful parable for Jesus to share that more powerfully goes against shunning as implemented, as enforced by Jehovah's Witnesses. Shunning that is mandated even in the family arrangement is unquestionably an unbiblical teaching. Item number two on my list is kind of an awkward one. <laughs> it's the teaching that God's name is Jehovah. The religion is literally called Jehovah's Witnesses and Jehovah's Witnesses teach that the only way you can have a relationship with God is to use the name Jehovah to identify him in your prayers. So anyone who doesn't call God Jehovah is essentially doing it wrong. But where does the name Jehovah come from? Well, let's look at the organization's own literature, shall we? <laughs> Watchtower of 1980, February 1st, page 11. Interestingly, Raimundus Martini, a Spanish monk of the Dominican order first rendered the divine name as Jehovah. This form appeared in his book Pugio Fidei, published in 1270 CE, over 700 years ago. So, isn't that interesting? Jehovah, the name Jehovah, as applied to God, is the invention of a Catholic monk <laughs> as recently as the 13th century. So that's how relatively recent the name Jehovah is. If you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you might be saying, well, if we're not supposed to call God Jehovah, if Jehovah is just the invention of a Catholic monk, what should we call Jehovah? Well, I've got another quote for you, which provides the answer. It's from Insight on the Scriptures, volume 2, page 5. Correct pronunciation of the divine name. Jehovah is the best known English pronunciation of the divine name, although Yahweh is favoured by most Hebrew 
scholars. Interesting logic there. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what's more accurate. It doesn't matter what scholars say, scholars who've actually studied the text and agonised over what would be the closest approximation in the English language to the Hebrew four-letter tetragrammaton, doesn't matter what they think. <laughs> what do they know? They're just scholars. <laughs> what matters is what's the best known pronunciation? What's the most popular pronunciation? Popularity matters, apparently, more than accuracy when we're discussing what we should call God. Item three on my list, the 2520 year period of Gentile times. This is such a peculiar teaching. I've dealt with it a bit more extensively on my 607 BCE video, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. This explains how the whole theology surrounding 607 BCE, 1914, and this 2520 year Gentile times period just makes no sense at all and is not based on historical fact. But I think you can cut to the chase with this very easily in demonstrating that this teaching is not biblical simply by going to Daniel chapter 4. Nowhere in Daniel chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's dream regarding an immense tree interpreted to mean anything other than Nebuchadnezzar going through a period of madness. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I refer to Daniel chapter 4, essentially Jehovah's Witnesses take this dream of Nebuchadnezzar's and they insist that it has a grander meaning, specifically when it talks about seven times. They link it to other verses in the Bible to calculate that these seven times must mean 2,520 years. Actually, it's not so much that they've done this. As I explain in the 607 video, this was crackpot 19th century Bible nonsense that they inherited from others. So Charles Taze Russell borrowed this theology about Daniel chapter 4 and the 2,520 years from other Christian thinkers of his day. It's, as I mentioned in the video, a cringeworthy vestige of this silly thinking <laughs> that proliferated around that period and Jehovah's Witnesses cling onto it. There's just one problem. When you look in Daniel chapter 4, it's very clear when it says all of this befell Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, if Tibor can bring up the verse, Daniel chapter 4 verse 28, all of this befell King Nebuchadnezzar. Imagine your God and imagine you are trying to convey to your worshippers how long a Gentile time period is going to last. Imagine doing that by means of this weird dream involving a tree and imagine then saying, but just ignore all of that because actually I'm only talking about this one king. That, that's a very clumsy way of communicating a far-reaching prediction about world history stretching thousands of years into the future. If you're going to do it in such a clumsy, ham-fisted way and include in the verse, by the way, there is no greater fulfilment, which is essentially what we've just read. Interestingly, the organization uses an earlier verse, Daniel 4, 16 and 17, to argue that it has this grander meaning. Let its heart be changed from that of a human and let it be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over it. 
This is by the decree of watchers, and the request is by the word of the holy ones, so that people living may know that the Most High is ruler in the kingdom of mankind, and that he gives it to whomever he wants, and he sets up over it even the lowliest of men. And they say, well, this means that it has a grander fulfillment. That's not what it says. It doesn't give any indication of a dual fulfillment. It's literally just saying the reason why God is doing this to Nebuchadnezzar, the reason why God is making him mad is to show him who's boss. That's what it plainly says in that verse. Why add to the scriptures? Why put words in the mouth of God and make Daniel chapter 4 say things that it simply doesn't say? The whole teaching about 1914 and the 2520 year Gentile times is an unbiblical teaching. Item four on my list, 1919. Now, you could be watching this thinking, well, isn't 1919 sort of the same as the 1914 teaching? Are they really two different things? I would argue yes. I would argue that whereas the organization at least tries to force the Bible to argue for 1914, even though it doesn't, when it comes to 1919 as a landmark year in Bible prophecy, what's interesting is that the organization cannot point to a single verse for arriving at that specific year. This is actually something that really amazed me when I went to MTS back in 2005 Obviously, I was still a believing witness at that time. And they showed me this chart, which Tibor is going to bring up on the screen, if he's gracious. Periods of time recorded in Revelation. Everything you see in blue is essentially my handwriting or where my handwriting was. And I've replaced it with a neater text. But anyway, this everything in black is as it was given to me as an MTS student. And what you notice is that there's this period of 42 months from Revelation 11 verses 2 and 3, which supposedly gets you from 1914 through to 1918. But when it comes to 1919, there's nothing that gets you from 1914 to 1919. So if you look where I've said nine months in the middle, bizarrely, the organization uses this verse in Revelation 11 verses 9 through 11 about three and a half days. I shouldn't have said they don't use any verse. They try to use a verse. It's just that it's so bad. <laughs> And so obviously doesn't do the job that's been assigned to it that it's hardly even worth mentioning. Revelation 11, 9 through 11, which talks about three and a half days, that doesn't cover the nine month period of essentially Joseph Franklin Rutherford and his associates being imprisoned in Atlanta Penitentiary, which is what they claim it's talking about. How can you make three and a half days equal nine months? In my opinion, you can't. But what's interesting is when you look at what the organization has to say on this subject, in fact, there's a really good JW Facts page on this, which I will include in the description. He points out, he being Paul Grundy, to the Watchtower of 2014, November 15th, where it amazingly conjoins the 1,260 days earlier in Revelation chapter 11 with the three and a half days to arrive at 1919. And there's this chart in that particular Watchtower of 2014. Again, it will appear, hopefully, 
which shows what they've tried to do here. What we're looking at is essentially a cleaner version of my original notes from, M from MTS. So you have this 42 month period that takes you from near the end of 1914 through to 1918. So you can sort of get to 1918, but you can't in any way, shape or form using the Bible get to 1919. And what they've tried to do is say, oh, well, it does talk about three and a half days. So <laughs> if we add the three and a half days onto the 1,260 days, that's going to make up the shortage. No, it doesn't. Again, we're talking nine months until the release of Rutherford which is when apparently um, Jesus chose the faithful slave. The reason why they do push 1919 has nothing to do with the Bible. It's purely because that's when Rutherford was released. So they make all sorts of attempts to, again, force the Bible to agree with their narrative but in, in this instance, their attempts are laughable. You just do not get a single Bible verse if you investigate this, which I would encourage you to if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You don't get a single Bible verse that explains in any way, shape or form how you get from 1914 to 1919. It's an entirely arbitrary claim of Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus cleansed the temple between 1914 and 1919 and at the end of this period in Malachi that's when he chose the faithful and discreet slave. One small problem, there's absolutely no scripture supporting this specific period. Again, you can just about stretch it to 1918, but the concept of 1919 being a year of prophecy, a year that was predicted in the Bible, is not a biblical teaching. Item five on my list, the circumstantial evidence rule. And this is one where any Jehovah's Witness watching this video especially if they have never been an elder, will maybe question, well, what are you talking about? Circumstantial evidence? Rule? Where do Jehovah's Witnesses teach about that and what is it? Well, this is where we need to consult the book Shepherd the Flock of God. In fact, the next two points, points five and six in my list, are both things that can be found in this book. And the circumstantial evidence rule is a rule that essentially says you don't need an eyewitness in certain cases of pornea, which is interesting in the context of the organization's position on child safeguarding, which I'll get to. But it actually takes up a couple of pages of this book Rather than read everything, I will just tell you, well, I'll read part of it. You can find it in chapter 12. It's in items 7 through 9 in chapter 12. You'll see here, strong circumstantial evidence of sexual immorality, pornea. If at least two eyewitnesses report that the accused stayed all night in the same house with a person of the opposite sex or with a known homosexual under improper circumstances, judicial action may be warranted. The elders cannot apply one rule to every case. Each situation has unique circumstances. After two elders have thoroughly investigated the body of elders must use good judgment in determining whether serious wrongdoing has occurred. If the elders are unsure how to proceed, 
they should consult with the service department if questions are raised regarding scriptural freedom to remarry, see chapter 12. So again, this is a provision that says, okay, we're going to need two witnesses to prove that pornea or sexual immorality has taken place. But maybe there's a situation where it's just circumstantial evidence where, say, a married man has gone to the home of a single woman who he's, say, working with, and two eyewitnesses have seen him go in or seen his car parked outside all through the night while he was supposed to be away on a trip. That's enough for us to say the man and the woman had sex, therefore he's committed adultery, and therefore he needs to be disfellowshipped. It's the circumstantial evidence rule. But nowhere in that text, nowhere in the pages where this is discussed, does it cite any Bible verse. And this is quite a big loophole if you think about it, and you have to wonder, why aren't they applying the same flexibility when it comes to child safeguarding? Why are they insisting that there needs to be two eyewitnesses to an act of child abuse in order for it to be acted on judicially by the elders? Oh, we need two people actually seeing the abuse take place in that situation. But when it comes to adultery, well, we don't need to see them actually doing it. It's okay for us to just see his car parked outside all night. That'll do. That'll do as evidence. Again, you won't find a single Bible verse supporting this sort of rule. And this goes back to what I was saying before about pharisaical, quote-unquote, which, if you think about it, is a little bit anti-Semitic, isn't it? It seems to be pointing fingers at the Jewish faith as being inherently evil. I don't actually like that word that much. But when you look at what they were saying about the Jewish leaders and how they created this fence around the law and lots of extra rules, well, that kind of looks exactly like what we're seeing here. And this is a rule that the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses are kept in the dark regarding because it's in a secret elders-only manual called Shepherd the Flock of God. And you could argue that the entire existence of this manual is unbiblical. Because in the Bible... Whenever God has had rules for his people to follow, he's shared them with everybody. He hasn't had one rule for the priests or one set of rules for the priests and one set of rules for everyone else. The Bible is for everyone to read and everyone can be on the same page. You can have transparency. But when you have secret rules that only the elders know, what that does is it creates a power imbalance. And again, it's not a biblical way of doing things. Which brings me to item six on my list. Also in the Shepherd book, the don't ask, don't tell provisions. That's what I call them. Because that's what it amounts to. If you do something that you could be disfellowshipped for, and you can keep quiet about it for long enough, guess what? You might be let off the hook. That's essentially what this provision says. If you go to section 8 of the Shepherd Book, um, actually chapter 8, section 25, committed a disfellowshipping offence years in the past and the matter was never addressed. The body of elders may determine he can continue to serve. This is an elder who's been caught out or has confessed. If the following is true, the immorality or other serious wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago and he is genuinely repentant. 
recognizing that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned. Perhaps he has even confessed to his sin, seeking help with his guilty conscience. He has been serving faithfully for many years, has evidence of God's blessing, and has the respect of the congregation. Don't ask, don't tell. If you can sit on your sin for long enough, all the while judging other people for their sins, which might have been the exact same sin that you've been concealing, then, ah, uh, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Maybe you can continue serving. Maybe we don't need to disfellowship you. Isn't that interesting? And again, nowhere is a Bible verse given in support of this. It's a completely unbiblical teaching. And almost as though they've realized that this is essentially a get-out-of-jail-free card for elders, it's almost as though the writers of the Shepherd book have said, well, now that we've made this provision for elders and ministerial servants, maybe we should have a similar provision for everyone else. So if you go to section or chapter 12, section 57, it says, depending upon the circumstances, serious wrongdoing that occurred years in the past may need to be handled by a judicial committee. However, if wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago, and the individual is genuinely repentant and recognizes that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned, counsel by two elders may be sufficient. No need for a judicial committee, no need for a reproof or disfellowshipping, just counsel by two elders, because, oh, it happened years ago. And what happened years ago becomes less important with the passage of time. Again, on what Bible verse are you basing this? This is a shady, don't ask, don't tell policy that ordinary rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses are kept in the dark over. It's a provision that's clearly intended to benefit those in power. So that again, you have this power imbalance where those in power know what all the loopholes are whereas those who aren't in power don't. And ultimately, how can you in any way suggest that this is Bible-based? What is your basis in the scriptures for this sort of shady provision? You're not going to find one. Item seven on my list, the Paradise Earth teaching. This is, you could argue, a central teaching for Jehovah's Witnesses. It's the one that they lead with when they're trying to sell the religion. Wouldn't you like to live in a perfect paradise earth where there is no suffering, where food is abundant, where there is peace and harmony throughout all mankind and we can frolic with pandas <laughs> and eat watermelons to our heart's content? That's the central sales hook, you could argue, for Jehovah's Witnesses when they're going out trying to recruit people into the religion. There's just one small problem. The Bible doesn't support the concept of a paradise earth that people are resurrected into. And to highlight this point, I've mentioned before on this channel that the word paradise is mentioned in the Bible only four times. Think back to what I was saying earlier about God communicating his will to mankind and having, how many pages was it? 1,618 pages to communicate his intentions and his requirements to mankind. And in all of those 1,618 pages, despite planning for humanity to live on a paradise earth, he's only saying the word paradise 
four times. Something's clearly wrong there. <laughs> and the problem is that the entire teaching was dreamt up because initially the organization wasn't geared towards the paradise teaching. It was geared towards finding the anointed, finding the co-rulers with Christ, who numbered, according to the Bible students, 144,000. If you're a religion with aspirations of global expansion and you're limiting your membership to 144,000, you're going to reach a point where it's like, can we change this teaching at all? We could do with making it a little bit more accessible to people because we'd like to grow beyond 144,000. And indeed, that's exactly what happened in 1935, they started saying, okay, think of it as essentially two tiers. There's one group that goes to heaven. We'll call them the anointed. And there's a larger group. We'll call them the great crowd, the other sheep. And they get to live on the earth and be ruled over by the anointed. That way, our religion can be more attractive to, say, millions of people. That way we can essentially grow. I think that's how they came up with this theology. There's one small problem. Again, the word paradise only occurs four times. And furthermore, when you read the New Testament, which is outlining Christianity it only ever talks about going to heaven. And I have three scriptures here, actually four scriptures here to share with you, which make this point, John 14, 2 and 3, to begin with. In the house of my father are many dwelling places. Otherwise, I would have told you, for I am going my way to prepare a place for you. Also, if I go my way and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you home to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Jesus clearly talking there about going to heaven and preparing a place for his followers in heaven. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21 but our citizenship exists in the heavens, and we are eagerly waiting for a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble body to be like his glorious body by his great power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I saw and look a great crowd which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands. Interestingly, this is the verse that Jehovah's Witnesses use as the basis for this concept that there is this other group, this larger great crowd of people who will be subjects on the earth, of those who get to go to heaven, there's just one small problem. <laughs> In this foundational text that describes the great crowd, where does it say they are? <laughs> Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're in heaven even when it's directly referring to the great crowd in Revelation. It's describing them as being in heaven. And Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened, but another scroll was opened. It is the scroll of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. Again, where are the dead standing? the great and the small, standing before the throne. So it's kind of awkward <laughs> because, again, 
This is what they lead with when they're trying to hook people in. And this is what I believed as a Jehovah's Witness over many years. Oh, there's going to be this paradise earth. An argument that we would make was to say, well, the Garden of Eden was on earth. And the plan was that the human race would become plentiful and fill the earth. That's always been God's plan. He's not going to change it just because things went a bit wrong in the Garden of Eden. Well, who says that he can't change his mind, at least as regards the New Testament, and at least as far as the New Testament writers are concerned, when you die as a faithful follower of Jesus, there's only one place you're going, and that's heaven. And if it's any different, well, the least we can say is that God has communicated it very, very poorly. Because you'd think this would be one of the main things he'd want to clear up. Oh, I have this plan. It started this way in Eden, but don't worry. I have this plan that's going to make sure that ultimately the earth is filled with righteous humanity again. If that's his plan, again, why only four times? Of those four times when the word paradise appears, even the organization only applies the word paradise once to an earthly paradise. In the three other times, they're talking either about heaven, or they say the Bible is talking either about heaven, or it's some kind of metaphor. The only Bible verse that refers to a paradise that they say is about the earthly paradise is the one in Luke 23, 43. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the only verse in the entirety of the Bible where an earthly paradise is referred to with the word paradise. Again, if this is really God's plan, he's got a shockingly bad way of communicating it. And ultimately, it all makes total sense when you simply accept the fact that the Paradise Earth teaching is unbiblical. Item eight on my list, the no beards rule. And you could argue, well, is this a rule? <laughs> I can imagine Jehovah's Witnesses watching this saying, you know, it's not like you can be disfellowshipped for having a beard, true, but there's very, very strong coercion, I would argue. I think that's the least we can say. Very strong coercion, if you are a male in the Jehovah's Witness religion, to be clean-shaven. There have been numerous examples in some of the recent videos produced by the organisation showing people becoming clean-shaven when they start being a Jehovah's Witness. I think one video even shows someone shaving off their beard because they've started studying. It's a really strange thing, and I have actually explained the reason behind the rule in a 2014 video, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear, why the ban on beards. There is a reason for it. Maybe it's not the reason you were thinking. The organization gives all of these explanations about it being about giving a good impression. Well, we don't want to appear scruffy. We don't want to look like hippies. <laughs> we don't want to detract from our message of good news by drawing attention to ourselves, all of that nonsense you'll often read or hear about in the organization's materials. But that's not the reason. There's another reason, and it has to do essentially with the ego of Joseph Rutherford. But obviously, it's self-evident that the Bible is silent on this. In fact, it's not just that this no-beard quote-unquote rule is unbiblical. If anything, the Bible is pro-beards. So a few verses for you here. Leviticus 19 verse 27, 
you must not shave the hair on the side of your head or disfigure the edges of your beard. Leviticus 21 verse 5, they should not make their heads bald or shave off the fringe of their beard or make cuts on their body. Actually, I think that verse is invoked um, as a reason why witnesses shouldn't have tattoos, interestingly. <laughs> 2 Samuel 10 verses 4 and 5. So Hanan took the servants of David and shaved off half their beards and cut their garments in half at their buttocks and sent them away. When David was told, he at once sent men to meet them because the men had been deeply humiliated. And the king told them, stay in Jericho until your beards grow back and then return. So apparently having one's beard shaved off would be a humiliating thing to do to someone, according to the Bible. <laughs> if anything, the Bible seems quite strongly pro-beard, but for reasons that are entirely unbiblical, the organization makes it extremely difficult if you are a Jehovah's Witness male to have a beard. I can remember an elder in my congregation back in the UK being counseled. He had a beard and it was because I was in quite a liberal congregation. No one really bothered so much. But I can remember hearing about other congregations writing to our congregation and saying, you're sending this guy to give talks and he's got a beard. What's up with that? And in the end, he was under so much pressure that he ended up shaving it off. Because I think the official rule is you can't have a beard if you are giving a talk on the convention platform or at an assembly but you are sort of allowed one at congregation level. But I have personal first-hand experience of even having a beard as a congregation elder becoming problematic for an individual. So really, it is a rule. And when you think back to what I was saying earlier about the fence around the law, oh, it's not so much about what the actual rules are, we want to stop people from getting anywhere near breaking them. So we're going to create a whole bunch of other rules to serve as this fence to stop people from... No, come on. That's exactly what we're seeing here. And regardless of whether you can be disfellowshipped or not for having a beard, there is obviously manipulation and coercion for men to not have beards, which is wrong and unbiblical. Item nine on my list, no birthdays. I don't have too much to say on this. Again, not a single verse in the Bible says that it's wrong to celebrate the day of your birth. What Jehovah's Witnesses commonly do is they say, oh, well, whenever it talks about birthday celebrations in the Bible, something terrible happens which is true, there's the story of Herod's birthday at which the head of John the Baptist gets cut off and there's Pharaoh's birthday at which someone is also executed. So bad things happen in the two birthdays that are mentioned in the Bible, therefore birthdays are bad, therefore God doesn't want us to celebrate birthdays. That is plainly terrible logic. It's quite conceivable that God would have no problem whatsoever with birthdays and still include these accounts of bad things happening coincidentally at birthdays. If we're going to use that logic, as I've often said, the Bible also condemns dogs. Because whenever you see a reference to dogs in the Bible, almost certainly it's going to be something bad about dogs or someone being likened to a dog in a negative way. The Bible writers had nothing good to say about dogs. Does that mean we're not allowed to have dogs? 
you can't set these rules based on such flimsy logic. Either God, through the Bible, clearly and unequivocally says it's wrong to celebrate one's birthday, or God is silent on that. And again, he had plenty of room in the Bible to lay as many rules down as he wanted. But in all of the rules, nowhere does it condemn birthdays. So how can you possibly justify, again, putting words in the mouth of God by saying God condemns birthdays, birthdays make God sad because, oh, look, something bad happened at these two birthdays. Which brings us to the final item on my list. Item number 10, the dissuading of higher education. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find any verse that says it's wrong to go to college or university. I mean, self-evidently, there weren't colleges or universities as we know them in Bible times. But even so, you can't even find any principles that condemn going to college and going to university to improve your knowledge. That's just nowhere in the Bible. And what I find most infuriating about this teaching is not just the fact that it impacts so many people, I can remember, even though I went through college for two years, my thinking was my priority has to be pioneering. I'm doing these two years of college so that I can get a better part-time job so that I can pioneer. These ideas have a real impact to the extent where most, I would say, Jehovah's Witnesses will turn down higher education. Only a small number will find an excuse to go to college or university. And the thing that really infuriates me in terms of double standards is the fact that the organisation will gladly accept a Jehovah's Witness who's been through law school to act on their behalf as a lawyer in defending lawsuits arising through the mishandling of child abuse. So they have it both ways. On the one hand, they dissuade their young people from improving themselves, from reaching out for more knowledge that's going to potentially contribute to humanity in general, such as, I don't know, coming up with COVID vaccines or treating people who have COVID, saving the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses in hospital settings, for example. They dissuade young people from bettering themselves in that way, while at the same time leaving the door open for anyone who's a doctor who can come and work at Bethel and treat Bethelites, or anyone who's learned law to come and work in their legal department, if it benefits the organisation directly, suddenly higher education is okay, but for the rank and file, we'd rather keep them uneducated. We'd rather limit their opportunities, limit their potential. And apart from this being just an abominable form of suppression and limiting people's opportunities, it's also, as it happens, unbiblical. Nowhere in the Bible will you find anything that expressly warns followers of God or followers of Jesus away from higher education. So, <laughs> those were my 10 teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses that are unbiblical, that cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. And if you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, again, what does it say about your religion if there's so much of it that's just not in the Bible? I mean, granted, some of the stuff in Shepherd the Flock of God is kind of, I don't know, a bit need to know and a bit niche. But some of this stuff is quite central. The name of God. Scholars say God is pronounced as Yahweh. We're going to call him Jehovah because 
that's what a Dominican monk in the 13th century came up with and it's good enough for us. Not biblical. And that's the central teaching. Paradise Earth, central teaching. Shunning, disfellowshipping people and telling them that their families should ignore them and treat them as though they're dead. Central teaching that impacts on everyone's lives in the organization in some form or other. And yet you can't find clear support for it in the scriptures. If anything, you can find many scriptures against it. So I hope I've given you food for thought, especially if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses or still carrying elements of Jehovah's Witness indoctrination. I hope you found this video helpful. And before I go, quick shout out to my amazing patrons who voted for this topic, who specifically requested that I address this particular issue. Thank you very much indeed. That's all I have time for. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.